Welcome to this session of the Center for the Economics of the Internet here at the Hudson Institute. We're very pleased today to have with us Howard Simons from the Federal Communications Commission. Before we get started with our program, I just want to announce some upcoming events. Uh, this Wednesday, July 1st, we'll have Greg Sidak, who will be speaking about antitrust and intellectual property issues uh, associated with standard setting. On July 15th, we'll have Kathy Brown uh, with the Internet Society speaking to us. And on July 20th, we have Senator Deb Fisher of Nebraska who will be speaking to the center. We hope that you can attend all of these, and we hope that our online audience will uh, either be here in person or online, and please tell your friends about these events. Today, we're going to have Howard Simons. And Howard and I have known each other for a uh, good many years. Uh, we met each other during the drafting of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. I think we were both in kindergarten at the I time. I think we were, so. right, exactly. Uh, Howard has, uh, for decades, been one of the leading telecommunications lawyers in the country. Uh, he is both knowledgeable uh, about the law and about how Laws are written, and uh, clients have come to him for many years for good counsel. Uh, Howard decided to go back into government recently. There's something coming up. Uh, it's called the 600 megahertz auction, which some people think may be the largest auction in history, uh, or certainly one of the largest auctions in history. Uh, and so uh, he's he's. He's, he's decided to go back into government, and he is the vice chair of the task force on uh, the upcoming auction. Uh, and uh, everyone uh, waits uh, with ears cusped to hear the words of wisdom that are going to come from Howard, because uh, this is a very big event. We're very pleased to have uh, Howard join us today. He's going to kick off with uh, uh, a few prepared remarks, and I will follow up with some questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, Harold, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. Um, one thing I've learned about going back into government is that I'm now better looking, funnier, and smarter <laughs> than I was just before I came back to the government. So it's been a very nice experience in that regard. Um, and I'm sure that that will persist even after I leave government. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, open uh, for a couple of minutes and just give you a, a sense of, of uh, where we've come from, where we are right now in the incentive auction, where we're going. Um, Congress passed the Spectrum Act in 2012, uh, authorizing the FCC to use incentive auctions to clear spectrum uh, and uh, make it available for new purposes. Uh, historically, when the FCC wants to uh, uh, repurpose spectrum, it would do so by, uh, by fiat. It would just say, we're going to change the use of this band from, from purpose A to purpose B, move the incumbent users to a new band. But in 2012, Congress said that, uh, gave us another tool called incentive auctions, uh, that, well, in which we would promise to share the proceeds of the sale of the spectrum we got back with incumbent users as a way of inducing incumbent users to uh, relinquish their spectrum rights. And the first instance of the incentive auction that Congress directed us to uh, undertake was the broadcast incentive auction, to use the incentive auction mechanism, uh, this, this market mechanism, uh, to try to uh, encourage broadcasters to voluntarily relinquish their channels in the UHF band so that we could repurpose the UHF band for wireless, uh, for wireless broadband, flexible use licenses, we call it. And so beginning in 2012, uh, before I came to the government, uh, the FCC undertook to write the rules uh, to implement uh, the statute and to uh, execute on the broadcast incentive auction. Uh, we are now in the final phases of getting ready for it, uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, just last week, Chairman Wheeler circulated to the other commissioners a document that's called the Procedures Public Notice. And what the Procedures Public Notice is, is the uh, detailed procedures for running the incentive auction. 
Uh, it covers things like opening price methodology and formulas, uh, the, uh, uh, how reverse auction bidding is going to run, how forward auction bidding is going to run, uh, how we will determine the initial clearing target in the auction. Because one thing, uh, about, one thing that's different about using the incentive auction uh, to repurpose spectrum as compared to the more traditional regulatory fiat is that until the auction starts, we don't know how much spectrum we're going to repurpose. Uh, and that, that unknown requires us to make contingency plans in our rules uh, in order to address the, the actual amount of spectrum that uh, broadcasters bring forward when the auction starts. So we have to have a mechanism for determining the initial target, our initial clearing target, based on how many broadcasters voluntarily elect to participate in the auction when the auction begins. So how we determine that clearing target is also one of the topics in this procedures public notice. Now the procedures public notice is an outgrowth of another document that we published, that the commission published back in December of last year called the comment public notice. And that was a propo the proposed set of procedures uh, on, uh, on how the auction will run. We had comments, we had many comments, uh, replies, many ex-party meetings, and the upshot of all of that was the proposals that the chairman put forward last week in the procedures public notice. Also last week, the, the chairman circulated two other related uh, draft items, one uh, called the Mobile Spectrum Holdings Reconsideration Order, a draft of that which addressed the uh, market-based reserve that we proposed, that the commission adopted last year to run with the, uh, uh, the incentive auction. Uh, and another called the part one uh, uh, order, which deals with uh, designated en entity and other bidding credit rules, which is being handled by our wireless bureau. Uh, so we've got all three of these items. Uh, they'll be moving, uh, they're now in front of the other commissioners uh, who are reviewing them. Uh, we have an open meeting at the Commission on July 16th, in which we expect that these, uh, these three items will be taken up, considered, and voted by the full Commission. Uh, assuming that occurs, uh, we will be on track uh, to meet the Chairman's goal of taking applications in the incentive auction in the fall and commencing the auction uh, in the first quarter of 2016. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are a number of other items that have been put out for public comment in connection with the incentive auction that don't bear directly on how we're going to run the auction, but are important uh, to, the, to, uh, to the full picture of, of uh, running the auction and repurposing the UHF band, the 600 megahertz band for wireless broadband. Uh, one uh, we call the Inner Service Interference Order, or ISICS. Uh, that, will, that deals with the uh, technical rules that we will uh, use to ensure that uh, wireless operations don't interfere with broadcast channels that wind up being assigned uh, to locations within the wireless band because we don't have enough room in the smaller TV band post-auction for all the stations that want to remain on the air. Another is called the Part 15 Rules. That's another technical proceeding. Uh, to address the technical standards so that unlicensed use in the guard bands within the 600 megahertz band that the FCC authorized last year don't interfere with the licensed use of the 600 megahertz band uh, that we're primarily repurposing the, uh, that we're per repurposing uh, the UHF band for. Uh, a third item deals with uh, the rules for uh, low-power TV. Uh, low-power TV stations will be moved as a result of the incentive auction. They're currently occupied channels in the UHF band. Uh, when, we, when we reduce the amount of space in the UHF band for TV channels, uh, uh, low-power TV stations and translators will have to, re many of them will have to reapply for channels in the smaller uh, TV band. We've got a notice of proposed rulemaking to address the rules uh, to govern that and to try to assist low-power TV stations in making the transition 
from their current channel assignments to a smaller TV band. Importantly, uh, the Spectrum Act did not protect low-power TV stations' existing allotments uh, or existing assignments, uh, but we're trying to work with the low-power TV industry uh, to, to, uh, to preserve and make sure that there's a, a, a vibrant low-power TV industry uh, after the auction as well, notwithstanding the lack of statutory protection for, uh, uh, for those channels. Uh, so those three items are also in process, uh, and um, we are uh, hoping to uh, address those later in the fall before the auction. Uh, finally, uh, uh, just to look back for a moment, uh, this auction succeeds or fails uh, on broadcaster participation, which by law is voluntary. Uh, so my colleagues and I just completed a four-month uh, tour of uh, broadcaster information sessions, we call them. We informally call them road shows, but that sounds like too much fun, so we don't like to use that phrase. Uh, we visited about 30 different markets around the country and met with broadcasters in all of those markets. And those markets are all around the country, from Buffalo to San Diego, from Miami to Seattle. Uh, we had uh, general sessions with broadcasters and met with many, many broadcasters individually at their request to give them information on the auction, how it would work, what the opportunities are for broadcasters, uh, and, and, uh, and to get their feedback on questions they had so that we could uh, uh, more uh, uh, effectively address those questions and provide clarifications to them one-on-one -on -one and provide clarifications to them in this upcoming procedures PN. So uh, we're, we're, we're very focused on the supply side here because it is voluntary. Uh, this is a novel auction. Wireless carriers have had 20 plus years to experience, to gain experience in auctions. Broadcasters have really no experience in auctions and nobody has experience uh, in a two-sided auction like the one we're about to run. So we're very sensitive about the need to get out and educate broadcasters, be available to them as a resource. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, we've met uh, either in person or through teleconference uh, with uh, close to two-thirds of all the eligible broadcasters in the country. Uh, and we're hoping that that, that effort will uh, give them comfort uh, and an understanding of the auction and, and in turn lead to robust participation. So that's where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Uh, the chairman has announced his timetable. Uh, we are on track to meet it. Uh, we're excited. We've got a lot of hard work ahead of us. Uh, there's a lot of hard work that, that we've or that's already gone into this. Uh, but we look forward to um, a successful and timely auction uh, for the benefit of everybody. Well, thank you very much, Howard. Um, let's begin with the broadcasters, and you, you describe it, the success or failure of the auction depends on their participation. Uh, and how would you characterize it at this point? And you, or maybe you want to refer to what third parties are describing as their uh, likely participation. How, how do you see the broadcast industry participating in the auction? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, I wouldn't want to offer a projection of how many or how widespread participation is going to be. Uh, I think that what we found on the road was a lot of interest in the auction. Some of that was interest by broadcasters who, who may, be, uh, may be interested because they want to relinquish their spectrum. Some of it is interest by broadcasters who intend to remain on the air and want to have a better understanding of uh, how they're going to be protected. The statute requires us to make all reasonable efforts uh, to preserve broadcasters' population and coverage area as, as those existed on February 22nd, 2012, the date of enactment of the statute. So a number of uh, broadcasters came to the sessions to understand how we were going to implement that statutory mandate. Um, I think that uh, our goal was really to provide information to broadcasters because we think that by informing them and educating them, they can make informed choices. And, and that's the most important thing we can do. Information, you know, in any marketplace, uh, uh, you want market participants to have as much information as possible. I think we achieved that goal. Uh, and, and we're hopeful that, that uh, in so doing, uh, that, will, that will lead us to a successful auction. 
You mentioned the importance of the initial clearing target, and there have been a lot of projections of what that will be by third-party observers. Um, could you describe just what the range is of, and I'll characterize this as third parties. I know the FCC doesn't have an official position right. on it. But what is the range of what the third party analysts are saying? Well, first, let me just make sure people understand this clearing target concept because it's, it's not self-evident, but it's important. Um, again, uh, the way the reverse auction will work is that we will open an application window, we call it, uh, broadcasters will see will, will will receive opening bid prices that we will generate. The commission will generate based on a formula that is currently in front of the commissioners for their review and approval. Uh, in, broadcasters will have at least 60 days to review those opening bid prices and determine whether they are set at a level that is sufficient to incur to to have them uh, to to lead them to apply. Uh, once we understand, or once, we, once the applications are in, we'll run a software program called an optimization program uh, that will uh, uh, evaluate uh, which broadcasters have elected to apply and where, uh, and determine the maximum amount of spectrum that we can repurpose for wireless broadband, which will be the sum total of the amount of spectrum we're getting back from broadcasters who apply, plus the, avail the already available spectrum in many markets simply because it's not unoccupied by TV channels. Now, we recognize that in some markets, uh, we're going to have more TV stations who want to remain on the air than we have room for in a repurposed TV band. Uh, we'll assign, the, the optimization program will assign those TV channels uh, a channel, host stations, a channel in the wireless band, we, and we call that we call that 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 concept an impairment, because the broadcaster locate who gets located in the wireless band will limit the availability of of, of bidders in the forward auction to use that spec the adjacent spectrum for wireless use, since they'll have to protect the broadcaster that's located there. Uh, but we have a cap on the amount of impaired population that we will permit in any given clearing target. Uh, uh, what's been proposed in the item that was circulated to the commissioners last week is that for any given clearing target, we will not impair, we will impair less than the equivalent of one channel block, the population of one channel block in each clearing target, uh, which is less than what was proposed in the comment public notice. Um, we have identified, to your question, Harold, we have identified 11 possible band plans uh, that the commission would accept uh, in the incentive auction. Uh, those, were, I, those were approved by the commission in the incentive auction report in order last year. They range from a high clearing target of 144 megahertz to a low clearing target of 42 megahertz, I think. Uh, and so the optimization program will consider, one, the, broadcast, the amount of spectrum that's been tendered back uh, through voluntary applications, and two, the overall impairment cap that will be permitted. And summing those things together, we'll pick the highest of those 11 clearing targets that's feasible given the, uh, given the broadcaster participation. So if a lot of broadcasters elect to participate, I suppose 144 megahertz is possible. If not that many participate, less than that will be possible. What third parties have looked at, uh, what third parties have, have pointed to uh, is the possibility of 126 megahertz, clear, 126 megahertz uh, which a number of parties have said would, uh, they project would be feasible. Uh, in which case we would sell 100 megahertz of that. 26 megahertz in that clearing target are reserved for guard bands and what we call the duplex gap, which is the space, the unoccupied space between the uplink and the downlink portions in these band plans. Uh, another bogey that people have put forward is 84 megahertz, in which we would sell 70 megahertz of spectrum. But what we'll do, uh, knowing what these 
what the possible ban plans are based on what the commission decided last year, we will analyze what we actually get back in the form of applications and pick the highest clearing target that's consistent with the, in, the cap on impairments that we've identified in the, uh, in the procedures PN, subject, of course, to the commissioner's review and approval of that, of that formula. Um, I, we have, as, as Harold suggested, stayed away from making our own projections. Uh, this is a market. Uh, you know, we are trying to encourage the maximum amount of broadcaster participation and, and, and try to clear as much as we can. Speaking of third parties, there also are investment analyst reports that look at uh, the other side of the market, the demand side, and how much the uh, wireless industry might be willing to, to bid. Uh, and I assume that gets factored into the uh, opening bid prices that uh, are being offered to the broadcasters. And, and how, do you, how do you pull that all together in terms of coming up with opening bid prices? Um, the, what we've tried to do at the opening bid prices is identify an opening bid, a set of opening bid prices that is high enough to offer interested broadcasters a generous price for their spectrum. Uh, but not, not so much, not so high, that we, we can't finish the auction in a reasonable number of rounds, uh, or that we can't close the auction at all because the amount of money that we would have to pay in the aggregate broadcasters to clear the spectrum would be more than we would get back in the forward auction from the bidders, uh, from the wireless carriers and others who bid to buy the spectrum that we're, we're getting back. So we've, we've, we've really... Uh, we're really striving for that for that balance, generous, but but uh, 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 at the right level to allow us to successfully run the auction and close the auction in a reasonable number of rounds. Um, the formula that we put forward in the comment public notice and are proposing to adopt in the procedures public notice uh, uh, assigns to each station what we call a station volume figure which is a combination of the station's uh, interference-free population and the number of other stations that a given station interferes with. Because interference by one station to other stations uh, means that uh, affects our ability to repack those other stations if they choose to remain on the air. What we want to do is find the right stations uh, who are participating uh, offer them a generous amount of money and, and then have be able to repack the remaining stations that want to remain on the air in the TV band in so far as possible. Using that volume formulation, uh, we uh, are assigning to the highest volume station in the country, which is in New York, uh, a value of $900 million uh, for an opening bid price. Uh, I should make sure I make that clear. That's the opening bid price, not necessarily what we pay that station because it's an auction. Um, but with an opening bid price of the, of the highest volume station at $900 million, we then scale down every other station in the country from there by, si by assigning a volume uh, to each uh, other station in the country based on its unique combination of interference-free population and constraints or interference. Uh, and then use, uh, uh, use that 900 million as the starting point and scale down from there based on, based on, the, uh, uh, based on the volume. We think that that, that number reflects uh, a good chunk of what we're going to get back in the forward auction. Uh, we have not proposed to adjust that opening bid price. A number of commenters came in and said we should raise it uh, in, in light of the AWS 3 auction results. We looked at that. Uh, we didn't think that that was necessary uh, uh, in order to achieve the, uh, the goals that the opening bid price is seeking to achieve. You know, we're like any auctioneer. Uh, we have to we have to find the we have to look for the sweet spot in uh, in picking the opening bid, whether you're selling a Picasso or whether you're buying Spectrum. Has there been discussion at the commission about? Uh, the uh, amount of the revenue that will go to broadcasters on the one hand versus the amount of revenue that will go to the, the Treasury on the other. Um, and the statute's completely silent on this. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, arguably 100% of the revenue goes to the 
broadcasters, and that would be potentially measured as a success. Others uh, on Capitol Hill are looking for some inflow of uh, money for Treasury. Has, has that entered that balancing act, if you will, entered into discussions at the Commission? Uh, when we, uh, it's a great question. Um, one of the elements, important elements of the auction design is something called the final stage rule. And that's a set of metrics that the commission has adopted to determine when the auction has reached its final stage. That doesn't necessarily mean the bidding in the auction will stop, but it means that we've recouped enough money uh, in a given auction stage. And we call running the auction and each clearing target a stage of the auction. Uh, it, it will tell us when in a, whether a given stage has recouped enough money uh, to be deemed the final stage and the auction to be deemed a success. The final stage rule has two components to it. One is the cost component. We obviously need to recoup enough money in the final, in the forward auction to cover the costs of clearing the broadcasters who've elected to participate in the auction and whom we have determined through the reverse auction we're going to buy uh, in order to meet that clearing target. Another element of the cost uh, component is the uh, uh, the uh, real broadcast TV broadcaster relocation reimbursement fund, a 1.75 billion dollar fund that Congress set up as part of the Spectrum Act to pay the costs of broadcasters who are, go who are going to remain on the air, but may have to move to a different channel as we repurpose the upper end of the uh, of the TV band. And then there are auction costs as well, uh, the cost the FCC incurs to run the auction. So that's one prong of the final stage rule, meeting our costs. The other prong of the final stage rule is really a reserve price. Uh, uh, and it, re and, and it, it goes to the, the question you posed, Harold. We want to make sure that the price, the, the forward auction bids that we get in, in, this, in a successful auction uh, reflect the competitive value of the spectrum that's being sold in the forward auction. Uh, and so the, the second prong, the reserve prong of the, uh, of the final stage rule has two components, <coughs> an average megahertz per pop price and a, a, an amount of spectrum. What we proposed in the procedures PN is that the average price be a dollar and a quarter per megahertz pop in the top 40 markets and the spectrum component 70 megahertz. So what does that mean? It means that to satisfy the second prong, if we're clearing less, if we're, if we're clearing uh, uh, 84 megahertz or less, so we're selling 70 megahertz or less, uh, the average price in the top 40 markets needs to be at least a dollar and a quarter per megahertz pop for us to close the auction. Uh, if we're clearing more than 84 megahertz and therefore selling more than 70 megahertz, we need to be the, the, the forward auction bids. The gross forward auction bid, bids proceeds need to total, total at least what you'd get when you multiply a dollar and a quarter per megahertz pop times pops times 70 megahertz. It's about $32 billion. So in order to close the auction, we have to meet our costs, and, we ha and the forward auction has to be generating at least this $30 plus billion. Now, it may be that the costs are $30 billion, in which case there's, there's not much for the Treasury. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the important thing is that the reserve is going to be that number. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Commission adopted the final stage rule, they determined not to include a minimum mandatory contribution to the deficit as part of the final stage rule. Uh, I, we want, we're mindful of, of uh, the statutory objective that we seek to return some value of the spectrum to the taxpayer through the forward auction process, but it's not a requirement. It's not, it's not a mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, we're, you know, we're optimistic that the forward auction is going to generate a lot of revenue, and there'll be a contribution to the Treasury. The Congressional Budget Office uh, recently sent a letter to Senator Heller in which they suggested that the net proceeds to the Treasury could be $25 billion. Actually, I think they said, in typical CBO fashion, you'll appreciate this, between 10 and 40 billion. So they gave themselves a little leeway there. Uh, I, you know, and they, that, was, that was CBO's estimate. 
uh, but uh, you know, it gives you a sense of what third-party observers believe that we could recoup for the Treasury, uh, or recoup for deficit reduction. So it's, it's, it sort of hovers a bit. It's not a mandate, uh, but we are very mindful through this second prong, the second component of the final stage rule in setting reserve uh, to make sure that the that we are receiving a competitive price for the spectrum that we sell and and part of that could well be returned to the treasury as as deficit reduction of course the prices in the aws3 auction were well north of the values that you just mentioned uh closer to two dollars 70 megahertz pop for the paired spectrum as opposed to dollar 25 nationwide um, on the other hand there were characteristics of the aws3 auction that it may or may not be replicated here for, for the 600 megahertz auction. Um, uh, any, can you share with the audience sort of what the third, I'll, I'll put it in that terms, the third party analysts are saying about uh, what the 600 megahertz uh, spectrum should go for? Because in theory, it should be much more valuable spectrum. Uh, AWS three spectrum. You know that uh, I, I think the chairman, as well as others, have pointed to the propagation characteristics of low band spectrum, uh, and and noted it's uh, that that those characteristics make low band spectrum particularly valuable. Uh, low band spectrum, six hundred megahertz spectrum, gives you in building coverage, which is going to be important as people as, as people increasingly cut the cord. Uh, for a variety of, fa of services other than just voice. Uh, and low band spectrum, by the same token, is also valuable in rural areas because it can cover greater geographic areas with fewer cell towers as a result of its ability to travel long distances. So we do believe that uh, uh, low band spectrum is quite valuable, whether it's more valuable than, than the capacity spectrum at higher uh, at higher frequencies, we'll let, let the market determine. Um, the, uh, and I've seen a range of, you know, range of estimates saying it's going to be far more than AWS3, and I've seen analysts who, you know, who say it'll be about the same, and I've seen analysts say it'll be different. You know, I think people don't, people don't know, but I think there is a huge value. The, the, coverage, the coverage characteristics of low-band spectrum do make it extremely, uh, extremely valuable. Uh, our effort in the final stage rule to set that dollar a quarter wasn't meant to approximate what we think the, the final prices that we'll fetch in the forward auction will be. It really was a reserve. You know, this is the minimum we want to get. Sure. This is the minimum we think we need in order to, uh, in order to be able uh, to say that we've met uh, the objective of, of uh, uh, getting a competitive price for the auction and possibly returning some of the value of the spectrum to, uh, to the taxpayer. Can you tell us something about uh, the status of coordination efforts with Canada and Mexico and, and where those are and whether they'll be completed before the auction? Uh, sure. The, the statute, the Spectrum Act tells us that any, any repacking of the, uh, of the 600 megahertz band has to be done in coordination with Mexico and Canada. Uh, and we have been involved in uh, ongoing discussions with them uh, you know, almost since the statute was, uh, uh, was enacted. Uh, in the uh, recently uh, adopted uh, order on reconsideration in the incentive auction proceeding, we described the current state of play in our negotiations uh, with Canada and Mexico. Uh, Canada, earlier this year, released its form of a notice of proposed rulemaking, which they call a consultation, which proposed to adopt the same ban plans that we have adopted uh, in connection with the uh, 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 repurposing of the 600 megahertz band. And talks with Canada are ongoing and, and obviously in negotiations with another sovereign nation. I can't say too much, but uh, I will say we're, we are very optimistic about the prospects for those discussions. Uh, in a timely fashion that will enable us to uh, run the auction and give both the broadcasters and forward auction bidders the confidence that uh, they will be able to, they'll have a, a, a firm set of uh, expectations, uh, a firm set of, uh, of uh, uh, constraints and, and other factors to take into account uh, when they engage in the bidding. Uh, 
Uh, and we said as much in the report and order, the, the recon, reconsideration order a couple of weeks ago. With respect to Mexico, uh, the chief of our international bureau recently returned from Mexico, uh, where she had uh, discussions on a wide range of, of international spectrum coordination issues with Mexico, including the 600 megahertz band. And she recently blogged on that. Uh, and I point you all to that. Uh, and, and again, uh, she was very uh, optimistic about uh, the prospects of, of coming up with a common band plan with Mexico well in advance of the auction so that we can factor the results of those discussions uh, into the final data files that people will use uh, to, uh, uh, in, in, in understanding the auction that we will use uh, in conducting the auction. So um, uh, I'd say uh, discussions with both uh, Canada and Mexico are well along, well on track. Uh, there's, I think, now public avail information people can look at as evidence of the fact that uh, we're going to get to a, a place, I think, fairly quickly where uh, 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 we'll be able to uh, run the auction and people will be able to understand how the uh, border constraints will affect the bidding uh, and the outcome of the auction. Howard, you mentioned the, uh, you know, we have experience with forward auctions. We don't have a lot of experience with reverse auctions or doing these simultaneously. And uh, I know a lot of very bright people are working very hard on the software. And, uh, can you just—they're the ones back in the building. Yes. I'm here, right? right. <laughs> Tell us how that's coming along, and, and how does one go about testing uh, software for an auction that of a type that's really never taken place? We have a lot, of, as you say, a lot of people inside the FCC and and consultants with deep experience in auction design working with us. Uh, on, both the, on both the reverse and the forward auction, because even the forward auction presents some, some new issues. Historically, uh, we've run our forward auctions, or we didn't call them forward auctions, like an analog watch. You know, until there was a digital watch, you didn't talk about an analog watch. Before we had the incentive auction, we didn't talk about forward auctions, we just talked about auctions. Um, but our prior auctions were uh, simultaneous multiple round auctions. Uh, the forward auction in, in the incentive auction is going to be an as, uh, ascending clock auction, which is formulated a bit differently than the traditional auction. So there, there's new software that has to be written for that as well. Uh, and of course, for the reverse auction, which is a descending clock auction, the software is being written for the, you know, for the, uh, for the first time. Um, we are well along in the, in the, in the writing and the coding of that. I uh, and uh, have a uh, uh, a plan, a testing plan, uh, mapped out, uh, which will include uh, testing both inside and by third party, uh, outside uh, uh, testers, to make sure this works. Obviously, this software has, has has got to be thoroughly vetted and will be thoroughly vetted well in advance of of the time that we turn it on to make sure that uh, that it works, both the individual pieces and the and the product as a whole. I have lots more questions, but I'm going to turn things over to the floor and invite questions from the audience. And uh, when uh, you've got the microphone, please identify yourself and ask your question. And uh, the, the gentleman in the back, we'll start with him. Thanks. Paul Kirby with TR Daily. Howard, you mentioned the three follow-on items. Um, you said later in the fall you hope to be done with those. Did you mean fall or did you mean this summer, just to clarify? Uh, by the fall. Gentlemen here in the front. Howard, uh, this is David Hatch with uh, Policy and Regulatory Report. Did Bill Baer's letter to the FCC chairman have any impact on his decisions, both on timing and the size of the reserve for uh, smaller carriers? Well, I don't, I, I don't want to pretend to speak for the chairman uh, on this or anything. Um, uh, certainly with respect to timing, the chairman has consistently said this auction needs to start this year with applications this year and commence uh, bidding at, in the first quarter of uh, uh, 2016, and, and he's been saying that long before we got the, the letter from the Assistant Attorney General. Um, uh, with respect to the reserve and the size of the reserve, 
Uh, you know, that, that's been under uh, intensive consideration by the chairman, uh, by the staff, and, and obviously now by the other commissioners. Uh, and um, probably uh, I defer questions about the impact of, the, of that letter and uh, to others within the commission who've been closer to it than me. In the front, lady, and then the gentleman. Hi, Katie Bachman, Katie on the Hill. So how, are you, how do you square with public television stations? I know they've uh, said that the statute says that, you know, there's supposed to be one uh, channel per market. Um, and if one of these stations decides to sell, will you keep that open for another station to come in and, and provide public television? Thanks. That's an issue, uh, Katie, that, as you may know, we addressed extensively in the, in the order on reconsideration that the Commission adopted a couple of weeks ago. Um, we are, the Chairman and all of the Commissioners are strong supporters of public television. The Chairman was on the board of PBS before he became Chairman. And, and uh, the, the Commission, as a Commission, is, is firmly, consider, uh, firmly committed to public television's mission and the mission more generally of all no, of non-commercial educational stations. Um, the, uh, uh, we, um, in the context of the incentive auction, uh, we have met with numerous public uh, broadcasting stations, with PBS, with APTS, the, the, uh, the trade association of the, of the uh, public stations, and with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and have been working with them to promote all the, the options that the incentive auction provides to stations other than simply going off the air and turning back their license. And there, there are three of those options. One is channel sharing, where a station that participates in the auction gives up its spectrum but not its license and continues to broadcast on a shared frequency with another station. Uh, the second option is to move from, UH, from UHF to a high VHF channel. Uh, from, that is from a UHF channel to a channel between channels uh, 7 and 13. And the third option is to move from UHF to a low VHF channel, channels 2 through 6. Uh, all of those give public broadcasters, or any broadcaster quite frankly, uh, the option of participating in the auction, uh, receiving substantial proceeds, but remaining on the air as a broadcaster, and particularly uh, mindful of, of, of the mission of public broadcasting, uh, the commission working, by, uh, uh, the commission itself and working through those three entities has tried to promote those, those, uh, uh, those options. We're certainly aware of the, of the concern that public broadcasting has put forward that there may be some markets in which the only public broadcaster uh, participates in the auction, the station is chosen, and, and, uh, and a community that may lose public broadcasting as a result. We believe that uh, that that is unlikely to happen, or if it does happen, uh, we don't believe it will happen in very many markets. The order on reconsideration describes the sorts of steps the commission would take if it did happen, um, that uh, uh, we would seek to reserve a new channel in those markets if we could. Uh, we would uh, perhaps uh, work with the neighboring public broadcasting station to bring its signal into that unserved community. Uh, but uh, uh, we think that it's more appropriate uh, and more effective to address that case by case uh, after the auction uh, because we don't think that it, the uh, uh, prospects of that uh, are very high. We're also mindful of the interplay between the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 uh, and the Spectrum Statute, and we believe that the choices that the Commission's made here in terms of running the auction uh, and, and providing opportunities for any broadcaster who wishes to participate in the auction to do so strikes the right balance. It's been a uh, while, oh, Monty Taylor, Communications Daily. Uh, it's been widely reported, I know my hair came off. Um, <laughs> it's been widely reported that uh, dynamic reserve is this, pricing. Wait, is this to make you look like Kirby? Is that, what's the deal? Here? I knew that was gonna come up. All right, good. I knew that was gonna come up. <laughs> he has to grow uh, Anyway, now, so. Monty Taylor, Communications <laughs> Daily. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's been widely reported that dynamic reserve pricing is going to be eliminated from the draft that's going to yes, be put before the Yes, I can confirm that. Because you the are confirming that. Right. Excellent. Uh, w DRP had a purpose, though, in the auction construction. You said it was, I think, to uh, allow you to offer higher opening prices. Uh, are you doing anything to compensate for DRP not being there? 
You know, it's a good question. Uh, we, you know, we looked, you know, the comments caused us to take a fresh look at DRP in the context of the auction. Uh, and all things considered, you know, the desire to uh, provide transparency and, and confidence in the auction prices, uh, the impact of DRP uh, in potentially creating additional impairments in the wireless band, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the concerns that, 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 that stakeholders across the board raised about it uh, you know, has led the chairman in the draft item to recommend a not, not using DRP. Uh, we think on balance that we can run a successful auction without it. Uh, we think there are countervailing benefits to not using it. We may be, it may be without DRP we wind up uh, paying some stations higher prices than we otherwise would. Uh, have, have we used DRP, but we, leave, but we think on balance the benefits of eliminating outweigh those risks. Now again, I'll say, I should say this to every, about everything, these are recommendations that commissioners are now only beginning to look at it, so obviously the, the final decision here rests with them. There's a follow-up question here. Uh, when in the uh, first quarter is the auction expected to begin, and is there anything that could potentially delay the auction start beyond the first quarter? Well, first quarter, I'm going to stick with first quarter. Uh, uh, that's as granular as, as, as the chairman has gotten, and therefore that's as granular as I'm going to get. Um, I, I guess we don't anticipate anything standing in the way, but uh, it, it, Anything is, you know, there, there may be unanticipated things, but I, we don't anticipate anything standing in the way. Uh, we, we're, we are very optimistic that we'll get the rules adopted that we need, uh, the ancillary proceedings completed in time, uh, and, and get the applications process going in the fall and move forward into the spring. Alina Silik with Reuters. Uh, you spoke at great length about the um, outreach to the broadcaster community. Obviously, their participation is integral to this auction. How would you characterize the interactions that the agency has had with the wireless industry to ensure that they, on the flip side, provide enough uh, uh, um, financial support to pay back to the broadcasters? You know, I mean, we're we're in regular and extensive contact with everybody with an interest in the auction, including wireless carriers, both individually and through their trade associations. Uh, and, you know, based on that uh, interaction and their own public statements are confident that there's a lot of interest by the wireless carriers in the, um, uh, in the auction. AT&T, even after AWS3, has reiterated its, its interest in the auction, a $9 billion interest in the auction. Uh, uh, T-Mobile uh, has publicly stated its interest in the auction. Uh, Mid-sized and smaller carriers individually and through their trade association have also expressed that interest and we're in regular touch with them, so. Howard, can I just do a follow-up on that? There was a report from Morgan Stanley about a week or two ago that kind of came up with numbers that if you added them all up, it didn't add up to an awful lot. Now. Some of those were just lower level numbers of maybe bottomed, uh, but is there concern that uh, there may not be quite as much money out there as it had previously been thought? You know, uh, we've seen those reports and they've come and gone ever since the AWS3 auction ended in, at the end of January. Um, I, I, I can't do better than to reiterate what the chairman has said, which, which is that the the interest in the AWS3 spectrum to us suggests there's, that there's a huge demand for spectrum and the, the different characteristics of low band spectrum, some might say the superior characteristics of low band spectrum, uh, uh, strongly suggest to us that there's going to be a lot of interest in this auction and, and we're confident there will be. Hi, Todd Shields with Bloomberg News. You mentioned that in some places the TV band, everywhere I take it the TV band is going to be smaller. Therefore, in some places TV stations will be assigned spectrum elsewhere. Will, will those stations be at some kind of uh, disadvantage 
as a result of that spectrum reassignment? No, not at all, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, the only other place we'd reassign TV stations in markets where we don't have enough room in the TV band for them will be in the UHF band. So they will be, if they're reassigned, if they're assigned, they'll be assigned to say this, a channel in the same band that they currently occupy. Uh, so they won't be disadvantaged in that, in that regard. Two, uh, we, uh, no matter where a TV station that remains on the air is assigned, whether it's a new, new channel in the TV band or a channel up in the wireless band, uh, we, have this, we, will, we will obviously respect our statutory obligation uh, to make all reasonable efforts to preserve that station's coverage area and population. So that same standard and our limitation on, on, on new pairwise interference of 0.5%, which is the, the rules that we adopted to implement that obligation, uh, will apply regardless of where the TV station is assigned. So they'll, they'll, be, they'll get the benefit of the same protections, the same standards that, by the way, the D.C. Circuit upheld a couple of weeks ago as, as, as uh, sufficient under the statute over the challenges by, by the NAB and others. Uh, uh, third, uh, we have proposed rules that will ensure that wireless operations that may be adjacent to any station that's located in the wireless band uh, will protect the TV station against interference from those wireless operations. That's not something that we have to be, that's not something that's relevant to TV stations that are assigned to the TV band, uh, but it is something that's unique for TV stations that are assigned to the wireless band. So we will have, we have this other set of rules. That's, these are these ISICs rules, these inter-service interference rules that will provide the protection to TV stations that are located up there in addition uh, to the standard protections that will be made available to all TV stations who are assigned to a new channel. Can you give us some sense of timeline on uh, repacking broadcast stations? Uh, when would that begin? How long do you think it'll take? Uh, when will uh, wireless carriers begin uh, operating that are currently uh, broadcast. That, that issue was actually addressed in the, uh, the uh, report and order in the incentive auction proceeding that the commission adopted last May, or May a year ago. Uh, the uh, repacking process will begin immediately after the forward auction closes. Uh, we, the commission will issue uh, what we've called what we call the channel reassignment or channel assignment public notice, which will contain all the new channels for all broadcasters that are going to remain on the air. Broadcasters will then have three months to file their construction permit applications to move to those new channels, and then there will be a 36-month period that follows that, within which all broadcasters who have to go to a new channel will be will will have to undertake and complete the construction necessary to do so. Now. Uh, not everybody will get 36 months. Some, uh, many stations will get less than 36 months. Uh, more challenging repackings will, will get longer than the easier repackings. Uh, but by the end of that 36 or 39 month period, the three month construction uh, permit period plus 36, all TV stations that have been assigned a new channel as a result of the auction will have to be on those new channels. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and that's going to be challenging, but uh, we believe it can be done. Uh, coincident with that, uh, we have adopted a process for dispersing funds from the TV Broadcaster Relocation Reimbursement Fund that I mentioned uh, at, at the beginning of the hour. Uh, and and uh, broadcasters will be able to uh, receive money out of, those, out of that fund before they actually go out of pocket. Uh, they'll be able to receive reimbursement based on, on the bills that they incur. Uh, and, and, and be able to get the money out of the Treasury uh, in order to pay those bills without themselves having to go out of pocket. One piece of the procedures PN that's currently pending that also goes to this issue of repacking and timing uh, is what we call the final channel optimization. I mentioned when we get applications in the first instance, we'll optimize, we'll run a, this optimizer program to determine the initial clearing target. At the end of the process, we run an optimization program to determine the final channels. And what we've proposed in the procedures public notice is to, uh, is, to, is to run that optimization program with the objective 
of, mi of minimizing the number of TV stations that have to move to a new channel. Uh, now, obviously, in almost any clearing scenario, if, if you're a TV station up at channel 49 or channel 50, in all likelihood, you're going to have to get you're going to have to go to a new TV channel because we're going to start uh, the repurposing of the of the TV spectrum, starting at channel 51 and moving down. Uh, so if you're up in the high 40s uh, or even the mid 40s, in all likelihood, you'll need a new channel. Uh, but we're going to try to minimize the overall the number of stations that have to move, and we're going to try to avoid uh, repacking that's particularly costly based on data that we have in our databases. Uh, so between those two factors, we hope to, uh, you know, better be able to uh, 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 make efficient use of the TV broadcaster relocation fund uh, and in enhance the feasibility of the 39-month deadline. Other questions? If not, please join me in thanking Howard Simons for joining us today.